you are happy. We love you. Pray with me, please. Lord in heaven, dear God, I love you. Lord, we pray for our pastor. Lord, that he would love you with all of his soul, with all of his mind, with all of his strength, dear God. Lord, always fill him with your spirit. Father in heaven, I pray. Lord, to fill him with more and more knowledge. Lord, fill him with more and more Jesus, dear God. Lord, may he be the man, dear God, that you always want him to be. And all of us can say that. Lord, he continues to grow him. Lord, in his preaching, dear God, in all that he does, even on top of all the years, dear God. Father, we pray for him. Lord, I pray for his spiritual well-being. And, Father, I pray for his physical well-being today, Lord. Dear God, bring him to a place, Lord, where he won't have to worry about no more surgery. Lord, where he won't have to think about all that junk, Lord. I pray, dear God, that you'd heal him. Lord, fill him today for this message, Lord, for the preaching of your word. God, let us listen intently. Lord, let us understand where it came from. <laughs> Lord, bless him. Fill him and anoint him, Lord, now, dear God, we pray in his Father's name. Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So you're at a cliff, and you go over the edge of the cliff, and it turned out not to be a little thing to do. You, somebody's got the rope on top of the cliff, but as you went over the edge of the cliff, you found out it wasn't just a little 10-foot thing. Things have changed. It's a thousand foot drop to a rocky, jagged bottom. Your friend, somebody you know, has got a hold of the other end of the rope. It's no longer a little thing to let you down slowly a few feet. You begin to cry out. For help, your friend that's holding the rope on the top of the rocks begins to cry out for help. The rope, in a few minutes, is burning their hands. Burning their hands. After a few more minutes, their shoulders ache, their arms ache, they're sweating. Their whole body's tense. The rope's begun to slide a little bit. They're just losing a few parts of an inch, but they're losing some of it. You're quit crying out. They've quit crying out. Only once in a while do they cry out. The rope now slides more. Their hand begin to bleed. They've got your rope. They're your hope. They're your lifeline. They're all that stand between you and a gruesome death. As they wait for help to arrive and the rope slides more and more and they're coming toward the end of the rope so they got to strengthen their grip and strengthen their grip on the end of the rope or you're going to die if you're over the edge of that cliff. Who do you know that you want on that other end of that rope? And all of us would say Jesus. But he being in heaven and us being here, who would you want him to cause you to appoint to hold your rope? Who has the character to bleed? Maybe mess up the use of their hands for the rest of their life. Maybe to even live with the fact that they failed and you fall. But who would you trust to hold on as long as anybody could possibly hold on? Who would you pick? Who would you say, hold on to me? 
We have a lack of character in this country. And we have a lack of character in the church. And Paul was hunting people that he could trust to hold the rope of the gospel. Knowing that they're going to bleed. Knowing that they're going to be in a strain. He's not only looking for people that he can trust to hold the rope of the gospel. He's looking for those that will entrust other people to hold the rope. One such man was Titus. And in his plea to Titus, he not only asked him to hold the gospel rope, he tells him to instruct other people to hold the gospel rope. Now, he didn't really tell him to hold a rope, but for my analogy's sake, the gospel rope. I'm old. You're not really old by what birthday you just faced. You're old by how old you are, by how hard you've been rowed, and how often you've been put up wet. This was my last sermon today. Who'd hold the rope? Not just to fill the table and put the pulpit back. We've had a lot of them leave us. I'm not going to name any names. But we're, since COVID and stuff, we've lost a lot of the people who you equate with this church. Just saying, oh, Who's going to fill their shoes? I harp at young people a lot while I'm preaching. I always have to pay attention. Because in just a few years, many of you young people sitting here, if there's going to be an Eternity Baptist Church, it'll be because you picked up the rope. And all you old people and in-between people, if you don't hold the rope, there ain't going to be nothing to come tie the rope to for them to get a hold of it. So Paul told Timothy in chapter 2 of, of Titus, rather, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. As for you, the title of this sermon is The Character and Service at Each Stage of Life and in Whatever Role. Do you have the character for whether you're a man or a woman, boy or girl, old, middle-aged, young? Do you have the character to perform the role that God ordained for you to live in your day, in this day. But as for you, in Titus's role, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Teach truth. You listen to me. This needs to go out across this country somehow. You lying bunch of profiteering, pulpiteering, moronic, sinful, backslidden, maybe lost, lawless, undone, money-grubbing, liars, servants of Satan, repent or perish from all the pulpits and all the mealy mouth, sniveling, Cry baby, preachers, bring it up a notch and grip the rope. And if your hand bleeds, let her bleed to the glory of God. And to the people sitting on the pews and chairs and whose names are on the roll books of churches, rise up. For in these last days you will be tested. Tribulation's coming. 
not just people being kind of snotty to you at the water cooler. Not just getting passed by for promotion because of your Christian values. But soon, maybe even in this country, you might lose your life over not denouncing Jesus Christ or standing for truth. Now, I don't want to scare you, but are your children prepared to risk their life? Your grandchildren, will they hold the rope or will they sign the paper or shut up? When they come to take our building, when they remove our tax-exempt status, when they arrest us, when they ban the Bible, that legislation has been proposed in California now because what the Bible says is considered hate speech. Liberals who you used to be able to trust to always be the ones to defend your right to speak, to offend your amendment, your Bill of Rights, now, some of them want to censor public speech. Our hope is not in the Democrat Party or the Republican Party. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. We need to elect Christians if we can find them. But aside from that, the church needs to be the church because we're the salt and light of this nation. But sitting around and going on about it, if you're not salt and light, hey, hello, hello, look at me, whatever your name is, just pretend like I'm, you're the only one in the room, I'm up here yelling. What's Brother Carl yelling about? I'm talking to you. If your name's Joe, if your name's Sally, put your name in there right now. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. You said you was old enough to be saved and baptized. You said you know what you were doing. Can the Lord Jesus Christ count on you to be a godly man or woman and to live up with the character that he's installed in you for you to accomplish your purpose in this lifetime? Your journey. But it's for you. Not just Titus, as for you. Titus was told to speak proper, to know and understand and articulate. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Then I talked to about this a little bit at the end of last sermon. Older men, but I got to put them all together because they tie together. Titus is supposed to tell older men are to be sober minded. This would do for older men, older women, younger men, younger women. This would do for teenagers. This would do for children. To think clear, to think straight. Be sober-minded. I'm sitting here right now. I have no muscle relaxer in me. I have no pain medicine in me. I want to be sober while I preach. I no longer drink. I do not take drugs, illegal drugs off the street. But I cannot afford all the time to sit under the influence of prescription drugs to the point that they cloud my mind because there's bigger things to do this morning than ease my pain. You say, well, I'm not preaching today, fat boy. I'll be able to drug it up here a little bit. Give me a, your pain pill and your muscle relaxer. And maybe I can sleep through your stupid sermon. Let me tell you something. God's got you on assignment. You need to be sober-minded. And I'm not just talking about dope and liquor and stuff. I'm talking about anger and I'm talking about sin and I'm talking about righteousness and holiness. 
you need to be sober-minded and working for God and not just full of American sarcasm and jest and jest. Uh, the, the conservative news shows make me mad. We're sitting here talking about potential World War III, and these clowns will get on there after a while and go kick, 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 and start poking fun at each other, and then the liberals and the and conservatives will go have lunch, and that, it's just to get their ratings up and sell you more product. There are too many of them. They need to be sober-minded if they're going to inform me about the state of the world so I can know how to pray. Amen? Amen. Not a comedy show. Titus 2, 2, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love and steadfastness. Clear-minded, straight-thinking, not numbed, not intoxicated, reverent, deep, solemn, wise, serious. When you got a problem, do you want a best friend or do you want a problem solver? I don't care if the doctor's my best friend or not. I just want him to be a really good doctor. Anybody else? I don't care if my lawyer's the funniest guy I ever met or quite boring and dry as toast as long as he knows the law and knows how to use it. Preachers need to get up and put on and go on. And now it's not to stay up in your three-piece suit with your hair all combed. It's to look like you just fell out of a rock band somewhere, you know, with your skinny jeans and poor theology to be really popular. Temperate, showing moderation or self-restraint, balanced, sound in faith. A believer and follower of Jesus Christ. That would really help for a lot of these preachers and leaders in church today, wouldn't it? Believers and followers of Jesus Christ. That would be that would be a rocket. Did you know in the average Southern Baptist church more people don't attend church than do? How serious a Christian walk can you have if you don't even go to church? Going to church is just the base. That's just training camp. That's just pep sessions. That's not the game. Out there. Yeah, that's where it's at. Amen. Doctrinally and theologically and orthodox and orthoprax. Believing right. How many of you young people know what you believe about anything? How many of you old people know what you believe about anything? How many of you could how many of you could survive if they confiscated your Bible? How many of you know any scripture you could quote? I don't mean, even you know what's right and what's wrong. Israel's at war. So what? What's that got to do with anything? What's that got to do with us? Living in and working out in Christ. Patience. Patience, able to accept or tolerate delays, problems of suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. Uh, you're going to develop patience in these days. How would you like to be waiting for Israel to decide what they're going to do to get back your family members that got kidnapped? There are Americans in that number. What if you went on a Holy Land tour to see the sights? And you're now in captivity with unkind and uncaring people. Are you listening to me? I want everybody in this room to pretend like you're in captivity for just a second. Just think about it. you're You're slapped in there and you ain't big enough and tough enough and your hands aren't free. And you're getting smacked around and you're just they're just thinking about you don't know if they're getting ready to burn you stab you now if that doesn't get your attention tough people we'll try this out what if you were held in captivity right now over the cause of christ and uh, it's not just you are you're not, you're not in captivity you're sitting in this church in captivity because your grandkids are being held at knife point to their throat 
Brother Carl, you shouldn't say stuff like that with the young people in here. You're going to scare somebody. You better get scared. You better get prepared. You better quit horsing around when it's time to pray, and you better quit deciding whether or not you'll go to Youth Encounter. I'm not going to Youth Encounter. Well, I don't care if you go to Youth Encounter or not because Youth Encounter is just something to do. But are you going to go with Jesus? We can't pizza you to death. We can't entertain you into heaven. We cheat you. We've robbed you. We've watered down the gospel. We just want you to be good, sort of, kind of, passable, enough to get by if you get a chance. Dream your dream. Do your deal. Play your lousy sports. Do your hobbits, habits, hobbies. Whoa, get your stuff out. Electronically blow your mind with just being numbed down to uh, just a little piece of puff that doesn't know how to do anything except push buttons. Live in virtual reality. Just leave us alone. Leave the parents alone so they can play with their gadgets and update their crud and get on all their forums and look up unimportant, stupid stuff and lust for people they no longer are around and just stay in constant conversation about idle baloney. Don't bother us with the Bible. And don't raise your voice, you old cripple. Because when you get loud, I just shut you off. Well, when you shut off the gospel, whether it's loud or soft, God's going to shut you off. And then, when you get when it gets tough and you're bleeding and burnt and hurt. You'll cry out to him. Here's a new read. Older women. Likewise are to be reverent in behavior. Reverent in behavior. I preached years ago about everybody wants to be 20. They dress the 11 year olds up like they're in their 20s, put all kinds of makeup on them, get them all dolled up, get them all where every male thing that goes by is pants. That's the goal, isn't it? Hurry up, honey. We want to make you look like you're ready to do the wild thing so all these boys will lust for you. And that way, that way you'll be popular. Yeah, you'll be popular. Plus, in this day and age, girls are just as wound up about wanting to do sexual stuff as boys are. You could have a boy who's a pretty good boy, and the girls will talk him into doing something. And now in this weird old world, the girls will talk girls into doing stuff, and the boys will talk boys into doing stuff. And then they can all change their name and go crazy. What in the world? Older women be reverent in behavior, not slanderers. I didn't write the Bible, don't get mad at me, Mel Chauvinist pig. People talk too much. Hello! People in this church talk too much. Well, you know what I heard? Well, you know what? The reason that bothered her, the reason that bothered him, what's that got to do with anybody getting saved and what's that got to do with anybody glorifying God? Anybody here? Here's when God really gets hacked off. I'm just telling you so you can pray. What a long prayer request. 30 minutes of garbage? Speculation? Judgmentalness. Do 
gossip, slander. This is supposed to be to old women, but young women do it, young men do it, old men do it, and kids do it. People talk and talk and talk. Wouldn't it be neat if God would seal your lips when you get to talking too much and you go, mm, 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 mm. just as a reminder, you know, and then you release it in 10 seconds. But I've been around people before if they was going, mm, mm, as soon as it opens, they go, I've got to tell you one more thing. Kind of like the boy that was looking at stuff you ought not look at. They said, if you don't quit that, God's going to strike you blind. He said, in both eyes or just one? Not slaves to much wine. The whole church would do good to sober up. There to teach what is good. I lamented to my wife yesterday. I don't remember any man offering to have an ongoing relationship with me in Christ. My grandpa didn't talk about Jesus. He said his name some, but it wasn't very nice. He drug the father into it too. My dad offered me my first whore. I smoked my first cigarette out of my dad's pack. Go ahead, have one if you want one. They invite me once in a while, like what Dan was talking about a while ago. You ought to come to church. They, I'm talking about the church. I told you how effective the church was with my grandma's Sunday school class coming after me. But I'm talking about in general, as a youth. What if some man would have said, I'm going to teach you about Jesus. Man, I wanted a man, a dad, a father figure of some kind. What if a godly man would have offered that? Not some pervert. I'm talking about some godly man saying, let me show you how to do a couple things. Look, look, look how to talk. Let me teach you how to talk. What if some godly woman poured herself into the women of this church? Katie Dungy was my piano player and a farmer's wife, and it's going to make a bunch of you mad. People cringe when I say this. I don't care. Just suck it up a minute and take in the good part without going, oh, I wouldn't want to be her. Katie Dungy's garage where they parked the car, Gerald would not allow cars to drip one drip of any lubricant. Partly because Katie kept her garage floor where if you had no plate, you could have laid down on your stomach and ate off her floor in her garage. She scrubbed it by hand, like the rest of her floors in her house. She was a Proverbs 31 woman, according to Gerald. She's still alive. He passed. She cooked for all the farmhands and when they could come in, they'd come to her table for lunch and have a big lunch every day, all the farmhands. And when they couldn't come in, she took it to them and delivered it out to the field. She kept her house immaculate, and she always looked nice. And then, when her kids were grown, she'd go out and do other stuff and make money on her own clean, bed and breakfast type stuff, Wren Lake Resort stuff, to make her own money. And he made a lot of money. Well, I needed a woman, a young woman Sunday school teacher. 
and Katie rose to the occasion. After just a few months of having Katie Dungy for their teacher, young men were coming to me. And young men said, Brother Carl, I don't know what you've done to our wives. It's the most amazing thing I've ever been a part of. My wife always looks nice. My wife always treats me nice. Our house is in order. She causes our kids to behave. When I'm not there, she doesn't just wait for me. She treats me like I'm some kind of hero or something. It's inspired me to be a much better husband. That lady you put them in class with, she just keeps pouring Jesus and herself into them and they, they're, they're acting like her. It's great. And some of you will want to go home and burn a poster of Donna Reed, but I don't care. Some of you got something to do when you're playing with your gadgets. Look up Donna Reed. But anyhow, I don't know what kind of Christian example she was. But anyhow, godliness being poured into people. What, what more? What more? Israel's at war. America's under judgment. What are you going to do about it, Brother Carl? I'm going to instruct what Titus instructed his people to do, what Paul instructed him to do. I'm going to instruct older men to be godly old men and older women to be godly old women and to train young women to be godly women. You know what we got a dose of in America? I'd have trouble getting younger women to listen to an older godly woman sometimes because a lot of younger women think they know everything already. Younger people lack humility. Overall, younger people lack humility in church, too. Brother Carl, you're just a mean old man. I'm mean enough to love you and tell you the truth. When's the last time you ever said, oh, Lord, I could learn from them when you're around somebody older? I learned terrible things from older people in my life. What if I'd have been around godly older people? My grandma tried to pour Jesus in me by force. That was her goal. Her heart was right. Train the young women to love their husbands and children. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home. Working at home. Homemaker. Oh, you want us to all quit our jobs? I didn't say that. I said Katie Dungy worked on the side. Kind. Submissive to their own husband. I'm going to tell you something, Brother Barnfield. If you think I'm going to say submit... I'm not going to do those wedding vows, then get married somewhere else. What are you marrying some dude you wouldn't submit to? I would never submit to him. Then why are you dating him, dear? Why do you want to marry some moron loser? Anybody listen to me? If you got a man who's not worth following, he ain't worth having. If he ain't worth having, he ain't worth dating. And he's certainly not even worth risking it if you behave sexually and everything to get yourself all strung out in your heart, all jerked out to bleed. Dump him. Adios, boys. Go play in the road. 
Let these girls have a chance at a man. And any of you punks that hit girls, I guarantee you, my hands are coming back. You couldn't whip this 65-year-old guy. Do you want to try it? Yes. Hurry, Carl, come back from the flesh. Shoot. Well, he, he hits me. Well, have him arrested and tell him, here's your junk and don't you come to my house again. Could I have one more chance? No, you had your chance. You blew it. Find something to do. Brother Carl's my grandpa. See ya. That the word of God may be not reviled. How many of you like to live your life in such a way as God can't get made fun of? Older women, likewise, not damaging anybody's reputation, not malicious. Hey, here's one of my favorite ones I've heard. I literally have walked up on this conversation before. Oh, I tell you what, no, I can't stand her. Oh, me neither. I can't stand somebody talks about people when they're not behind their back. Can you? No, me neither. You go, well, where's she at? And is this not? Yeah, well, okay. Let's jump down here about young women. <clears throat> Titus 2, 4, and 5. Train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled. We went over that. Teach young women, younger women to be teacher of good things, biblical, homemaking, in their relationships to husband, family, children, work balance. How many of you young women would like to have a work balance? This is going to fell out. I'm going to, I know this is going to sound like I fell off a turnip truck, but I'm going to just tell you my opinion. You go weigh it out and you ask the Lord and read your Bible. You hear me? I'm not, just, I want you to take this one and judge it to death. It's not my wife's job to provide for our family. Mine. It's my job to provide for my wife. which means we might have to live within our means. Then when our kids got older, my wife started working while they were at school. Now that they're gone, she works. Her money makes us have enough money to do Christmas and stuff, and her money makes us where we can eat. Special. Out. Whatever. Some of you all got my money and your money. And that's because you're not married. Hello, you're separated in your finance. Coral Barnfield's opinion, bad plan. We got a checkbook with my name on the top first, and we got a checkbook with her name on the top first. She got money, but it's our money. We're a couple. We are one. Anybody still listening? We're messed up. Because nobody can live their role. That sounds subservient. That sounds like prison. That sounds like male chauvinist pig stuff. You need a balance in your life. Women miss being women. Women miss getting to be a woman. I know men certainly miss being a man. We're unisexed. Think about it. We're unisexed in our roles in the home in the homes of church people. That's why it's so screwed up. 
women doing men's jobs, men doing women's jobs, everybody doing their job, everybody doing, well, I can tell you something, Brother Carl, you can tell me whatever you want to tell me. Why is your house so dysfunctional? And why are you so unhappy? Is it because I'm a male chauvinist pig or is it because you're running an experiment that's failing? You don't know about our house. It's great. <coughs> Let's talk in 20 years if God lets me live. How your house is running will be told by what your children turn out to be. And by the way, it ain't going to be about whether you got along with them for the seventh grade. And good luck in that. Right? It's stressful all having teenagers and stuff, I understand. Kids, period, whatever. But are you listening to me? Mom and dad or at a, you know, if, oh gosh. Has anybody ever thought about falling down before Jesus and say, I just want to study passages like this and conform my life to it and not do it in five seconds? It may, may, might, might take a two-year plan to get around to where, you know what I'm talking about? But to get to where you don't role play, live your role, live your God assigned role. That doesn't mean for some dude to come in like Tarzan, hey, I'm the leader here. Well, you got to go in bellering like that, yelling you're apparently not in charge of nothing because you could do it with a gentle, kind kiss if you're a real man. Hello, tough guy. Some guy that runs around his house with his big fist and his big mouth. I was, have you go out and fight all these teenage boys I was mad at a while ago? We'll just send three of them at a time. And then the women can do their woman stuff. You know where women are kinder and they can put bandages on you. And some of them got needles and they'll sew you. And if you're real mean, they'll sew you without a shot. That'd do good, wouldn't it? <laughs> now, are you with me? I'm not trying to force 19... 12 down your throat, but I am trying to say, I am trying to, I am trying to shove this out here for you to digest. I didn't write this Bible about homemaking. I told my wife, my wife can't take compliments. She never has, but I told her, I said, did you know, did you know I, I light up every time you come home? I said, our whole house lights up when you come home. The dogs go nuts when my wife comes home. I mean, they're around me like, eh, whatever. Oh, and the cat comes out. <laughs> That's what a woman can do to a home. It, it's alive. Men can multitask. Sometimes men can do a bunch of junk fast as women are faster. Oh. As far as getting some laundry done or doing dishes or something, if a man sets himself to it the way he sets himself to outdoor work, he'll get it done. None of the pets will be happy and the kids will all be sitting somewhere and trying to stay away from him. But uh, a woman adds a, that God thing about feminization, feminine, being a feminine woman is a Swell thing from God. I almost said being a feminist. Boy, that would have been. I did not mean that. Discreet. Quiet. Controlled. Not controlling. You listening close? Not controlling. How many of you women know you try to control your man? Here's one that the Bible forbid. Turn him off. Turn him off. Turn, put him out on the couch. No sex. That's ungodly. Some guys do that. Let's torture each other with holding back sex. See, golly, this culture is so screwed up. Everybody wants to have sex till they're supposed to. <laughs> Chaste. Sexually pure. Homemakers. Good, decent, wholesome. Oh, I long. I love being around wholesome, decent people, don't you? 
obedient, emotionally, all of it. Titus 2, 6. Likewise, urge the young men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may not may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Sober-minded, clear-headed young men. Man, oh man, some of you men, your mama should have untied the apron string a little sooner. Well, you know what? I work. I'm buying me 10 more guns, and I'm going to buy me a, six trucks, and uh, uh, what happened to you? Grow up and get out of your parents' basement. Some woman's going to get a real deal when she gets some of these dudes, these young dudes now. I quit. You, you quit what? I quit my job. Why? It was hard. Thought I'd just suck off your income because you're willing to work hard. Self-control. A lot of young men are violent. Because they lived, grew up in the Jerry Springer generation of stupidity and everything gets solved by hitting people. You want to hit somebody, get you a set of pads, go out and try out for a football team. Shoot, if you're that tough. MMA, man, that looks like a good release for some of you tough guys, doesn't it? Some other dude in there just as mean as you trying to pull your head off. Huh? He didn't want to fight all day, so he put you in a submission hold. Choke you. <laughs> Let me out. I'm going to go home and yell at my wife or my girlfriend. Because I don't want to commit to nothing. I just want to be baby daddy. Jerk. Child. Total lifestyle, not boyish, not foolish about money, hobbies, habits, or sinful activities. Not hooked on porn. You can't be satisfied when you can look at everything known. Girls laugh if you want to listen to me. A boy who looks at porn disrespects you, and you ain't nothing but a hoe to him. You're just a piece of meat. And then when he treats you like that, don't be shocked. Because he's ruled by his lust. You ain't enough for him. He'll have you and that and other stuff. And in this culture, when that don't suit him, he'll become a homosexual. Brother Carl, you have lost your mind. I can't believe I went to this church and you talked like that today. I can't believe you live in this world and didn't know I had to. Let's get around to the important stuff. Doctrinal integrity in young men. I'm going to go to the soul and show church. It's more entertaining. I got entertained as a preschooler. I love that church. They entertained us all the time as preschoolers. And then I went to the children's department, and they entertained us too. And then after I got done doing that, I, I went to the youth department, and they did anything they could to keep us coming, so they entertained us too. And then I became a young adult, and everybody was scared they was going to use us, so lose us to other churches or do something, so they entertained us too. And then... Then I went to the, uh, uh, the uh, young adult department, and they entertained us too because they say, oh, we need these young families bad. The church is going to die if we don't keep young families and their kids coming to church. So they entertain us all the time. And then we became middle-aged adults, and then they said, what are we going to do for them because we need them because they've got a little bit of money, and they, now they finally can spend some of it. And so we've got, to keep the, we've got to keep the adults in church. We've got to make sure they're happy. We need to entertain them and then the senior adults. By the time we got up there, then we start taking foliage chairs and going on stuff and eating all the time. And... And so we're all diabetic, but we take six shots and we go eat more. And, uh, and so that's what, it, anyhow, that's about what church is. We, okay, and the preacher said, oh, now the preacher's standing. I need workers. 
I don't know where you're going to get them. We've been entertained our whole life. That's what the church in America is right now. People who are church people from preschool to death must be coddled and entertained. And God says, well, Israel's at war. And I put you under judgment. And you're going to serve me. And you better repent. Next time, I'm going to talk about workers, servants. That ought to draw a big crowd. <laughs> Work is not from the fall. You listen to me? Work didn't happen because of the fall. Adam and Eve were working in the garden before the fall. Work is good. Oh, I'm starting the next sermon. Put under all that stuff so it won't stop. You don't have to run your house like I'm saying run a house. Run it wrong if you want to. My opinions are potentially garbage. You have to sort through this. I double dog dare you to go read that passage and be open to the Holy Spirit and say, Dear God, teach me from your word. I dare you to read the Bible and to read good commentary on the Bible. You women want to know what to do? Read the Bible, study the Bible. Don't get some nutty. Find a godly woman. You ought to be able to find it in this church. In fact, I got a couple of them teaching. You see, Sandy Rice is a good teacher, and Tammy Donnelly is a good teacher, and Robin Tolbert is a good teacher. They could teach you. They can teach you. They can teach you. And there's other women in this church that are godly that can teach you. And there are other women in this church, you should talk to me before you talk to them very long because you need to avoid them till they get taught. There are people in this church like there is everywhere who are a little unstable. You need to get under control before you start pouring into everybody. Somebody say, like you, about boys. I was just exaggerating. I can't whip anybody. But if a boy said, I'm going to smack my girlfriend or you, come on by. Because if I can get up, I will hit back. And in fact, you mealy-mouthed little punk, come by and I'll turn my wife loose. And I bet you'd be sad when you get done because she'll beat the snot out of you and you'll be going on home. <laughs> what happened to you? A grandma. <laughs> I'm not trying to beat you up today. I'm begging for this church to be a household of godliness in a wretched world. And I don't want to be on the big team anymore because they don't care what I think. I only want to be in places where my influence matters. And I want my influence to only be Christ and the gospel. Are you hearing? 
I can't reform everything. But I can be your pastor with whatever I got to offer. And these deacons can be your deacons and these teachers can be your teachers. We're sitting where we can say the leadership in this church is sound. Most people who are unsound flee from this place. For there are far better entertainment centers all over the place. And Satan wants to come to you all and say, you need to be more like them. You would have this building full. You would have your coffers full. You would do this. Do this. Israel's at war. America's under judgment. We're not going to entertain our way out of it. Somebody's going to have to be the real church, which is made up of real Christ followers. God-ordained church. God-ordained government. God bless them. I hope they take their job serious. God ordained the home. The family. Heavenly Father, have your way in this thing we call invitation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.